Hey everyone, uh, so welcome to another video with me, Jeff, uh, and we're going to be continuing on with working on Assignment 2. So last time we talked uh, mostly about dealing with um, the vector type and uh, putting together some basics for add and remove body in your world CPP file here. If I just open this up, I believe we were talking mostly about add body and remove body here. Ways that we could sort of come at this. Uh, if you were at class, you will discover that there is uh, a little bit more that we can do with this add body here, but I'm not going to delve into that detail here today. Uh, we stopped off at the point where we were looking at this destructor, and I wanted to hold back on the concepts um, there just a little bit. Because uh, I'm introducing a new keyword here. So, when I was talking about this destructor, <clears throat> what I wanted to get across is that, so everybody's familiar with a constructor, right? So, the constructor of a type runs when you create a new instance of that type. Um, so, of course, like we have our constructor up here with our GD world, and it takes two vectors in technically vector references, it passes them by reference. Uh, if Scott hasn't explained that in detail yet, you'll probably get it soon. Um, and when this runs, uh, it sets the elapsed time to zero so that our clock starts from zero and not some weird number, uh, and it takes in the initial uh, gravity acceleration and wind force and assigns them to those vectors there. So that's all what happens during the constructor. but. So this is what happens when the creation of the object happens, but in C++ often we need to do things when the object is destroyed as well. Because we're in control of memory management and it can be important to make sure that we get rid of things that we don't want anymore. Uh, because if we're the only one keeping track of them and we go away, so in the case of our GD world here, um, for example, we have this vector of GD body pointers and the world's purpose is to keep track of all of these pointers its job is to be the thing that knows where all the bodies are and can update them even if no one else cares where they are at all so now what that means is that if for any reason we get rid of the world maybe this is just when we're closing our program let's say and to be fair the operating system would kind of clean up for us in that case anyway but um, for the sake of of good clean code we should do this anyway is that when our world gets destroyed we need to make sure to go through these bodies and ensure that they also get destroyed because right now we have pointers to them floating around in memory somewhere, but we, if the world goes, no one else knows where that stuff is, and no one can really get rid of it. Um, aside of the operating system closing the program and deallocating memory for the entire program, like the OS will figure it out if it needs to, but if your program's going to run for more than a couple of minutes, um, having things that uh, get lost in memory and end up just wasting space doing nothing is not your ideal situation. So um, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, this is what we call a memory leak. Uh, when we have something that gets lost in memory and it inevitably causes the program's memory consumption to increase over time, um, that, that's, that's what we call a memory leak. So I can show you a really basic thing that you can do here <clears throat> that's good practice. So my destructor, I've written a couple lines of code. Um, so I'm doing a very simple thing here. It's nice to see that there is a simple way that we can interact with lists. After all this stuff that we went through, it seems like it should be hard to do everything, but thankfully lists are actually pretty useful for most things. Um, turns out that there is a version of the for loop that we can use here. Um, I'm using this auto again because it's handy, but technically in this case what we're talking about is this, so might as well be clear with myself. So how this reads 
is basically for each GD body pointer that I'm calling body in the list of bodies or in the collection of bodies. So in C++, this is not written as for each, but this should be pretty familiar to you from C Sharp if you're familiar with C Sharp's for each loops. Um, it's pretty close. Um, the only difference here is that we're only using four. So what I'm doing is for each of the things in the list of bodies, delete body. So delete's a new keyword um, that I mentioned. So what delete does is it explicitly removes an object from memory. Um, so what it does is it will go through to C++'s heap that is so a blob of memory, it's just sort of an open blob of memory that we can create objects in. And this body was created on the heap somewhere using the new keyword. So new and delete are kind of opposites of one another. So this will go to the heap and it will find where body is and it will run its destructor and it will get rid of it. Um, so all I'm doing here is before the world gets destroyed, make sure to go through all of the bodies and destroy them first. And if the bodies needed to do anything special themselves, um, they might have a destructor that calls something else to delete something else, and it will go all the way down the chain so that everything gets deleted that needs to be deleted, and everything's cleaned up by the time that the world's destructor ends. So that's the idea. That's That's the... The big thing that we're going for here. So in any case, um, that's, uh, that's this. So lastly, we're sort of looking at this update function. And before we take a look at that, it might not hurt to sort of go to the assignment document and take a look at the things that we're actually trying to do here. So um, actually, we have basically two scenarios that um, that we want to look at here. Starting from point two, so point one was make a world class. So we mostly have done that. So number two is create a new world with a gravity acceleration of zero and negative 9.8 and a wind force of zero zero. Add two bodies to the world with masses two kilograms and four kilograms respectively. Place both bodies at 0, 0,200 to start. Apply a force of 1,000 newtons in the positive x direction to both bodies on the first frame. And don't continue to do it after that. Use a time step of 0 0.1 seconds. Start your simulation. And write the current time and positions of both bodies to a file called gravity.csv. So this should be very familiar from assignment 1. Um, your output's going to look a little bit like this. Here. So you'll be ticking through 0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and these positions x, y. You want to do these in separate columns, so you'll probably want to have commas between x and y here rather than trying to mash them together. Um, and so we stop simulating after both bodies have fallen below 0 on the y axis. <clears throat> and at that point, you're going to want to open gravity.csv into Excel and uh, make a couple of uh, make a couple of charts here. Uh, you may find that you have to save this uh, I'm just noting here you'll want to save this as an XLSX file because a CSV file can't support charts and stuff like that so your data is going to come out in this CSV and you're going to have to uh, save it as an XLSX. So you'll be putting together a couple of charts here. So you'll be using scatter scatter plots or scatter charts um, and answering just a couple of questions about your impressions of, of what's going on and explaining sort of the physics behind what's what's really happening here. So that's, that's the basic idea. Um, so this is really a lot like assignment one. Um, and then basically the major difference from assignment one is that you're going through and repeating the same thing, uh, but this time you're going to put a wind force um, going in the negative direction on the x-axis and plotting this again and talking a little bit again about um, how the motion, like 
what motion is happening and how it is similar or different from similar to or different from um, what happens in the first simulation. So that's a basic idea here. So, okay. Um, now, sort of jumping back into to here, um, of course, um, last time we were looking at what variables we have sort of in our main here. Um, we have this jet ski, we have a current time, we have this force. Um, force is kind of equivalent to what wind is in this situation. Actually, it's uh, pretty close, except that wind will apply to several objects instead of just one. Um, this jet ski is going to change form just a little bit. And this current time here uh, has been incorporated into the world, so that's the world elapsed time now. Um, so, before we go too far, I'm, I'm just going to handle a little bit of this. I just want to um, get a tiny little start on main here. Or actually, so... Very often, I don't delete code unless I kind of really need to, or or there's a good reason to. So I'm just going to. Um, oh shoot, I left this in. So I should have you know that um, I've already included GD World in this file. So if you haven't done that, it's a good time to to do that. Um, and so I'm going to create a GD World, and I'm just going to call it World. So I'm in my main.cpp, and I'm just putting together the very very basics of like the world that I'm interested in here. So the world that I want um, is going to have, <clears throat> I'll call it world one actually, because I know I'm gonna need two of them. So I have my gravity at 0, 0.0, negative 9.8, and I have my wind force at zero, zero. And okay, so there's that. All right, so I have this first world and um, I'm gonna leave this statement here as maybe a little to do for for you guys to uh, to consider working on um, I'm just I guess we don't need to do that um, I'm just uh, sort of floating through here and trying to figure out what things we should probably do I'm gonna delete out these objects at this point because um, we don't really need them I'm just going to make a couple modifications here, and I'm interested in particular in, of course, showing you a little bit about how to print out uh, the lines uh, from the world that, that you're really interested in here. So, actually, I'm going to... I'm going to make these bodies uh, for the sake of it. So let's... Um, because I want to show you what it looks like when we are creating bodies that are pointers. So, now I talked about new and delete. Now, I don't know how much you've seen of that in your other classes. Um, so, I had mentioned delete here. So, delete removes something from the heap. Um, so we're going to talk about this a whole bunch, and probably more in time you'll start to understand what we mean by the heap, um, and sometimes you'll hear us talk about the stack. So the, these are different places in memory that things can exist. Um, and so usually when you have a pointer, uh, if you are creating a new object, you are saying new gdbody. And new tells C++ that this object is going to exist on the heap. Now, I'll leave that to another class for you to get detailed information about what that means. But notice how different it looks to construct this than it looks to, to do what I've done with world here. For example, let's say if I wanted to do the same thing here with a body two, but instead of making a pointer, I want to create it in place. 
um, you probably would have the good sense that it would look something like this. Or it could, at least. Another valid way of writing this is to say um, GD body 2.0. Both of these are fine. Um, so what's different here, of course, is that the new keyword is being used. So when new is used, what happens is that C++ goes away to the heap, it allocates some memory for this object, puts it somewhere, and returns you back an integer which acts as the pointer to the memory that that thing belongs in. So it just goes and finds space for it in memory, plops it there, and then returns you an address and says, okay, the memory's over there. If you want it, go get it yourself. That's basically all that's happening here. Whereas body two, um, if I were using this form, it is creating it within the context of this function, that this object is literally just taking up memory right here in this place. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages to both of these strategies and you'll learn plenty more about those as time goes on but I just wanted to be able to sort of clear up the way that this syntax works um, and again um, you know sort of reinforcing so this is one way that you can write creating a body in place um, but you could also write this and that is perfectly valid as well this is what I usually write so you can see that world one here is in this same form so, <clears throat> anyway, uh, if I just go back, so we were creating two bodies with um, masses of two and four kilograms. So I was only creating body two in place to sort of describe that bit about the formatting, um, but for now I'm going to leave both of these as pointers. It will just be more convenient sort of down the line um, if, if that's what we're doing here. Um, and I want them so that I can print some information out from them. Um, so one thing um, that you're going to notice about using uh, pointers, uh, oh, it's called world one, not world. My mistake. Hmm, well then. Okay, actually in the service of doing this uh, in the long run, I'm actually going to um, I'm going to actually make world a pointer as well. That's cool. It's fine. So we've got world, and when you're using a pointer, you have to use an arrow instead of a dot afterwards to access methods and properties. Uh, this seems kind of weird. And you, of course, in C sharp, you can use a dot for everything, so it seems like why should it be different? Um, I don't know, I suppose the syntax could be the same, but it is actually kind of nice as a reminder to you of what things are pointers and what things aren't. Um, so that doesn't hurt. Uh, so basically, all I'm going to do is that in my output here, I'm changing this current time variable that I used to have into the elapsed time variable that exists within the world. So that's one thing that I'm doing. And then I'm just going to fill in these four lines with the X and Y positions of these bodies. So, of course, if I just typed body1.x in here, well, first of all, it doesn't even have an X and I'm using a dot, so that's a problem. So I can use an arrow here, and then that lets me look through what I'm interested in. I want the position, but the position is not a pointer. So body one is a pointer, so I have to use arrow to get its position. But position is not a pointer within this, so I have to use dot again to get position dot x. So this will be maybe a tiny bit confusing at first, um, but it's uh, it's something that you're gonna you're gonna adapt to as time goes on. You just get used to it. It's the way it is. Can't really complain about the way things are too much. It's not really productive. So I'm just gonna adjust these. Oops. So I've got body one position x y body two position x y and. Um, yeah, I guess let's just copy this down and then I'll just change this into comma. 
That'll be easier. And that's how that should look. All right. So I've got these things dumping out body one, X, Y, body two, X, Y, and the current elapsed time. So this is how we would go about writing a line of the table. Uh, I probably should update my table header as well to make sure that it's giving me uh, what I'm interested in here. So let's, um, let's say body one, X in meters and update these other things so we've acceleration so that's going to be body one Y in meters and this one is now body two X in meters and we have body two Y in meters and I'm just going to copy this and then change those slash t's into comma separation for printing to a file. All right, nice and easy. Okay, um, also it asked us to dump this to a file called gravity.csv, I believe here. So I'm gonna just double check this. Um, yes. So we've got gravity CSV that we're dealing with. So I'm just going to call it that. Um, sure. Now, I want to sort of go back and rewind here. You don't really need to use world as a pointer here. You could get by without. I'm only doing so for like kind of a particular reason that I think maybe I can reuse some code a little bit better if I'm doing this, but um, it's not a super important change. Now. I kind of want to test where we're at here. I, I want to see um, I want to see where we're at in the code. Um, I'm just going to open this up so that I can see what files are in here because I'm going to be interested in that CSV file pretty soon. So I don't know. Let's give this a run and see if it gives us any problems. It seems like a good time to sort of check up and make sure everything is working more or less right. Okay, so we get zero for everything, which is not wrong. That's fine. Um, and it looks like it's printing out the table formatted pretty nicely for what we're interested in. So that's a pretty big win. Looks good. Um, so I'm going to stop this. And uh, good. Sure enough, we have gravity.csv showing up in here. So if I double click on that and see what it gives me. Great. All right. So this is a good start. We have all the things that we're interested in having in here, um, printing out the way that they're supposed to be. Um, so at least we don't have to worry too much about that. It's mostly down to updating these things and uh, having this sort of flow of time um, happen. So I'm just gonna go over this main loop. So. Of course, you're going to have two loops that go on here. So you're going to have one with a world that has no wind, and you're going to have one with a world that has wind that goes in the negative direction. So at some point, you're going to have to create a different world um, and run a second loop. So that's, that's one thing. And um, so these loops, and I guess at some point, you're also going to have to... Um, you're probably going to have to open uh, the output file stream to a different file. So, sure, why don't we think just a little bit about how some of these, these top-level concerns would go here. Um, I might as well look at it from the perspective of using this world pointer. I I'd mentioned that this doesn't really matter a whole lot. Um, I'll see if I can show you a couple of alternatives here. Um, I should also note this end loop here, uh, of course, this no longer is when the jet ski comes to a stop. This is um, when both bodies are below zero on the y-axis. <clears throat> so that should give you a pretty good idea of what kind of uh, exit condition your loop would have here, right? Okay, so now what we can do here is kind of 
like we could honestly just copy a good big chunk of uh, what's happening in here. So I'm still going to leave this get car at the end of the program to just stop it if, um, if we're at the end. So I'm going to put a little bit of space between these two so that we can tell uh, which one is which. Uh, so I notice that I am not recreating this output file stream here um, because there's not really any need to. Um, this thing should continue to, to exist even after I close gravity.csv. So I should be able to use that file out or that output file stream again to open a different file. Um, or at least I'm pretty certain how this works. I have not actually tested this one before uh, jumping into this tutorial, so um, fingers crossed. Uh, so ideally, that should be how that goes. Um, and so we're just gonna open a new file here, so that's um, so that's one thing we can print the headers just like we did before. Um, oh shoot, yeah, there was this little line of this update that I didn't change yet. So, update the jet ski body. This is going to change ever so slightly because we're now talking about a world, and so in service of keeping this. Uh, this demo from getting too too long um, I'm gonna end off with that update function of the world and updating the bodies accordingly uh, so I'm gonna show you how things change when a world gets involved and how it can kind of save you a little bit of work um, so this is now going to be instead of update the jet ski body we're going to be updating the world so we're not going to be updating the bodies individually anymore because that's this thing that one of the big things about the world that we want to hold on to the reason this is useful is because if the world's job is to update each of the bodies and we only ever call update on the world itself then it means that there's no way that one body can get updated more than others or in a different order than they're supposed to or any of those things that they will always be updated sort of in the same process by the world and we only ever have to call it one time in order to accomplish this and it just sort of saves us all kinds of trouble it saves us lines of code it saves us potential bugs it's it's a good thing <laughs> um, so we're going to be talking about updating the world in just a second. Um, but um, first, before we go there, I'm going to just think about this, this world variable that I'm using here. So there's a couple different things that I can do here. Notice that this second simulation, if we go to my document here, um, I need to have a wind force of negative 20, 0. So I have a couple of options here for setting this on the world. There's a couple ways that I could go about doing this. Um, to be fair, probably the most, I don't know, clean among these options is just to say world arrow um, wind force dot y is equal to negative 20.0. That's one thing that you could do. Um, playing with some of the lessons that we've had so far, if you wanted to try um, doing something using um, creating a new world and deleting the old one, um, so this is maybe less what I, I recommend, but it will work just the same is it would be entirely possible for you to write something that's like uh, delete world um, world equals new well actually let's just grab this chunk from before because it's pretty close to what we want to write so and then all I have to do is say negative 20 there so what this will do is it because 
if you recall that GD World is in fact a pointer and that we created it to begin with with the new keyword so there is a GD World out there in the heap memory somewhere that we have created and we have an address to it so like anything that's on the heap we can use delete to tell it get rid of the one that we have and then we can create a new one now I should note creating new objects more than necessary can be a fairly expensive operation and I don't mean like a square root I mean like hundreds of times a square root uh, if you have not heard that square roots are a big deal you probably will pretty soon Scott's probably gonna make a big fuss about it sooner or later um, the, uh, certain operations on the CPU take longer than others and instantiation onto the heap is especially one of them it is a very very costly operation so you don't often need to do this um, too much or at least you should avoid doing it more than absolutely necessary so now this could be good in a scenario where for example we needed to do more things than just this or for some reason perhaps we needed to completely reset everything and be a hundred percent sure that we're starting from scratch and that nothing happened here now actually this reminds me if we go back to what we were doing before talking about resetting things note that our elapsed time doesn't get reset here although I believe because elapsed time is public uh, we should just be able to set it to zero so that's one thing we could do so um, going back to our previous way of doing this this by changing these two things we reset it properly and sort of put things back to kind of where we would be interested in having them be but um, the nice thing about taking this strategy that I'm talking about here deleting the world and recreating it is there is no way you can forget anything it will definitely reset everything so sometimes you don't <clears throat> pardon me sometimes you don't care about performance and you just want a sure bet you want a sanity check that will tell you for sure that things are working the way that you think they are or that you're setting the variables that you think you need to set so this can be helpful uh, at times but this is the fastest way for the computer to execute it so um, use appropriately wherever you kind of need to um, so just a couple more things here we want a position I'm gonna throw this in as a to do So you want to position these bodies according to what the document says and you should remember to reposition the bodies here now if you were using this strategy here you would want to probably create um, you would need to add these two bodies as well to the world here so I'm in the end not going to use this solution I'm going to stick with this one because I feel like I know enough about what's going on to be able to say this so basically what this means is that if I'm not recreating the world the world still has the bodies that were added to it before and I'm just gonna reposition them so they've moved a bunch now but I'm just gonna set them back to their initial position the way that they were supposed to be and sort of continue on with life um, so that's what I'm going for here I'm just gonna run this quickly okay so we get two tables everything's zero that seems about what I would expect uh, lastly I'm gonna go down here and gravity with file with wind what I was thinking all right so let's run that one more time all right so we have gravity with wind and it's coming out I don't see any reason that it should be formatted weirdly and it isn't so great everything looks good um, alright so lastly I'm just gonna take a quick look at world again um, and probably just briefly at body as well because if you recall of course we have this body update um, and so we had talked a little bit about what update does in here although I haven't sort of revealed the details of this just yet um, so 
what I'm going to do here is world is going to take over the responsibility of this update. So, you know this fancy little for loop thing that I put together here for deleting? I'm going to use something just like it because in the world's update, I want to go through each one of the bodies and I want to update it. Now, you're going to say, well, doesn't that just mean something like that? Well, it can. Um, that works. It does. Um, and I think that this is good for what we're trying to do here today, although you may find uh, in the long run, uh, if you were trying to make yourself a good physics engine, that in fact this update function from body might vanish entirely. Um, this update function in body could just simply belong to here. So instead of having an update function in body, um, world's update does all of the math inside itself for each one of these, each one of these objects. Um, there's a couple potential performance reasons for this, but mostly it has to do with the fact that if you're trying to deal with resolving collisions intelligently, um, you don't necessarily want to break that up into the responsibilities of the individual bodies because the world knows more about the positions of all the other bodies than the individual bodies do. Um, I'm not going to get into that um, fight for now because I think this is fairly sufficient for what we're going to. Um, but I can show you what it would look like if you were doing something like this. Um, I might as well grab these statements here because they're more or less accurate. So I'm going to look at this the way that we could just do the math right here on the spot. Um, and instead of even having an update in here, I'm going to get rid of it. And sure enough, that will make the CPP complain. So I'm going to get rid of this update here as well. So I've got my three statements here. Um, so we had talked about resetting the acceleration. So that's one thing. So I got a. Oh, and notice that I call this delta time. Um, you could call it time step, you could call it delta time, kind of up to you. So I'm just going to throw in here. So this is where we are taking the body's acceleration and transforming it into velocity. This is, this is referred to as integration, and specifically Euler integration. So that's E-U-L-E-R, the, the mathematician that you've probably referred to as Euler a few times. Yeah, it's Euler. Don't say Euler. You'll sound like an idiot. Um, so what we can do here is there's a couple different things that we can do. Now, you'll recall that our... Um, our vector 2 has been upgraded in a couple of ways using these fancy things to, to make it possible so that we can um, so that we can just multiply a couple of numbers together here. Um, so I'm going to see if this will work. I, I think it ought to. Um, so we have the body's acceleration and we want to multiply that against the change in time. So I want you to see here that what we're talking about is like v final. Oh, my mistake. I need a plus equals here. So actually, you know what? Let me write that with the equals just for a moment so that I can make this as clear as it possibly can be. Uh, oh, I didn't overload plus on its own. Okay, well then we're not doing that. So what this looks like is v final is equal to v initial so that's the plus equals because we're saying add this to the current value of velocity and store it in velocity so velocity final is equal to velocity initial plus acceleration times time that's an equation you ought to be familiar with this is the equation to integrate acceleration into velocity and something very similar is going to happen with position. 
So if we talk about displacement final is equal to displacement initial plus velocity times time, right? Because if we take a velocity and multiply it by time, we get a distance. So something very similar should happen here. Um, so this is going to just be position, and instead of acceleration, this is going to be velocity, and um, that looks pretty good. Now, if your um, if your vector two isn't upgraded in all of the same ways uh, as mine with all of these um, operator overloads, uh, another way that you can approach this is to do something. A little bit like um, velocity dot x and acceleration dot x and dot y dot y. It does get to be a little bit nicer if you can just use the vectors kind of as as they are. Um, I certainly prefer to just be able to do math on vectors directly rather than having to use uh, their member values directly um, but both both ways work both things are perfectly good ways of coming at this assignment uh, especially given that you've not really had a whole lot of time to make a big fancy vector but for me in my version I'm gonna stick with the one that I have here so now just as a quick review of the situation here I've removed update from GD body because I am basically saying that it should be the world's responsibility to do the updating to move those those bodies around. Um, so that's that's the biggest thing that we're talking about doing here. Um, and so I also removed update, of course, from GD body's CPP file. Um, and now all of these things sort of belong in here. And this is the basic flow that you can expect for one of these things. Probably somebody out there is asking why I'm not using the equation that involves at squared over 2. And you could, but in my experience, um, this is probably sort of the tightest flow for, for how this integration can go. And it's also very easy for someone to read, even if they don't necessarily know physics all that well. Like, the equations aren't super complicated, so you can kind of figure out what ought to be going on here. That's one of the biggest concerns of writing code for me is trying to keep things understandable. Um, so that's that's a big thing going on there. So, um, yeah, like, now, I might as well give this to you as a freebie, because at this point we've got our update, and if you were guessing, uh, well, is it that simple? Uh, yup. That's what it looks like. So that's me updating and passing on to the world that 0 0.1 seconds are going to go by. And that's all I need to put for that, and the world is updated. Um, and I'll just copy that into the one below as well. So, um, yeah, that's... Oh, look at that. I just noticed, increment the time by one time step. Well, hey, neato, the world keeps track of this, and in fact, we should probably make sure that it does. We didn't say anything about the elapsed time here. This does, in fact, keep an elapsed time, but when we call update, of course we want to make sure that the elapsed time increases. So why don't we do that? Pretty easy to do. for this frame. Sweet, look at that. Okay, so now the elapsed time will increase by one step of delta time whenever we pass that in. And, um, cool, look at that. So one step of this goes away. All right, we're getting a little bit closer to the world, kind of doing all the work here, so that feels pretty good. Um, and I'm just going to run this one more time, see what's going on. Nothing really should have changed, but sanity check to make sure I didn't break anything obvious. Um, okay, so the tables come out properly, 
and we have our two files. Let's see if they open. Um, okay, not sure. Okay, so I have gravity here and gravity with wind. Great. Okay, both of those are working more or less like I would want them to. All right, so um, I'd say that this is this is at a pretty good spot. So at this point, um, you should be able to sort of go ahead, position the bodies where you need them to be positioned, add them to the world using the functions that we put together to do that, run your simulations, and then make sure to open up the CSV files here and start plotting the positions of those things through time. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's a pretty good stopping off point. We're at about 45 minutes. Um, great. Uh, okay, well, I'll see you in class then. Good luck with the rest of the assignment.